Hello? Yes, you can hear me. So, good morning, everybody. We are glad to see that the crowd is growing. <laughs> Hello, welcome uh, to this session, which is dedicated to the first of the two sessions that are dedicated to the fuel cells and hydrogen. That's correct. You're not in the wrong room. And uh, this is indeed still the research transport, uh, road transport research conference. So welcome back for the second day. And uh, my name is Pietro Caloprisco. I'm a project officer at the Clean Hydrogen Joint Undertaking. And uh, together with Roland, we will be moderating then this session, which is dedicated uh, to the low TRL projects in uh, uh, fuel cells and hydrogen transport applications. Now, I understand that this is the first year, actually, that uh, this technology is admitted to this conference, and uh, we are really glad. And I think it's also a testimony of uh, the maturity that we have reached. Uh, the first uh, joint undertaking started already in 2007. And uh, since then, we can see the huge progress that we have made. And I think this is particularly visible in transport. Back in the days, the focus was really on light duty vehicles, material handling vehicles, then we moved on to buses. Then over the years, we have seen an increase in the performance of all the components, the technology, the fuel cell systems, and we have seen also the cost decrease. So it now it only makes sense that fuel cells and hydrogen are considered as an option, a mainstream option for the decarbonization of heavy duty application, waterborne, aviation, trains, and what we are going to talk about today, especially its road heavy duty applications. So from the technology point of view, there has been this progress in a very broad uh, way. And then we will hear some more uh, about the details. And I think it's also interesting just to mention very, mention very briefly that this also had the impact beside the real world also here in Brussels in the way we operate. So in the past, I mentioned we had the first joint undertaking and we were the only outfit that was solely ded dedicated to the development and the deployment of fuel cells and hydrogen uh, applications. As we started, the technology started to mature, we are starting to cooperate more and more with the additional organization. So you will see joint undertakings such as clean aviations or Europe rails that they were really were not really dealing with the fuel cells and hydrogen in the past. Now we are starting to cooperate with them. And the same goes with the two zero. And uh, the idea is really that we are avoid overlaps and that we are uh, really going in the same direction, I mean, in the same direction. And if you want to understand broadly how we can cooperate, also maybe when you're looking for funding, as a rough guideline, you can imagine the following. We, in our joint undertaking, we are looking at the building blocks, the development of the fuel cell system and all its key components. While the other joint undertaking, the other organization are more looking, let's say, at the development of the vehicles. And so the idea is then to merge the results, the outcomes of what our programs are doing. So, this morning we have two sessions dedicated to this technology, and the first one is going to look more, I would say, on the low TRL side. And uh, we will start with three projects, and I was told not to anticipate too much about them, not to spoil the surprise. And uh, just two reminders, so one for the speakers, I was several times told by the organizer, you have to stick to 15 minutes. So it's not coming from me, but I will have to be sharp on that one. And for the audience, please hold your questions until the end. We will have the Q&A at the end. We, will have, we should have sufficient time for then uh, having a discussion about the technology. And last but not least, also during the coffee breaks, remember to go downstairs. There is a little bit of an exhibition where you can get additional information about technologies and other events. And with that out of the way, I would like then to invite the first speaker, <coughs> Johannes. Johannes has 10 years of experience in the sector already. He's a mechanical engineer by formation. He's working in the AVL uh, on research, project acquisition, and project management. And he's also the coordinator of one of the joint undertaking uh, projects, More Life. Johannes, please come here and tell us more about the project. Thank you, Peter.
So, good morning, everybody. Thank you for the nice introduction. Thank you for having me here. Um, I was reminded that I have to speak into the microphone. <laughs> um, so, more life. Um, uh, it's about durability, it's about uh, decreasing costs, and it's about uh, optimization, the lifetime of a fuel cell application in heavy duty, uh, in the heavy duty fields. So, uh, a rough project key facts. So, we have seven partners involved. Um, uh, we uh, are from around four countries. Uh, so, it's uh, NetStack, EKPO, Technical University of Munich, uh, Mebius, University of Ljubljana, ABL, and uh, Technical University of Eindhoven. We have a rough um, budget of uh, 3.5 million which is 100% funded, thanks to uh, the clean hydrogen and the EU. Um, we have a rough person months and the project already started in 2021. And we are about to have a little extension of the project. And uh, we are aiming to have uh, to end the project by uh, beginning of 2025. So, um, about our core objectives, um, as I said, it's all about durability, it's all about costs, and, uh, and also the implementation of the fuel cell technology in the heavy duty sector. And therefore, some specific tasks need to be triggered. We have to um, figure out how we can accelerate it, how, how we can perform accelerated stress tests to do a lifetime uh, verification. Um, we do uh, a specific uh, improvements on uh, the core components of the fuel cell, so-called the catalyst layer. Um, we, in parallel, also uh, we try to um, to improve uh, degradation models, which is a key component, uh, I would say. Um, and for sure, uh, resulting out of these um, points, we will uh, try to optimize and to validate the operating uh, the operating conditions of the fuel cell, and in the end, uh, doing um, a full uh, fuel cell uh, lifetime indication. So this is basically the story of uh, of our project, and um, now I really really want to to focus on uh, the uh, results that we have gained so far, um, <clears throat> because this is the focus of this conference, as I've heard. Um, and as I said, it's about also the understanding um, of how can we endure and how can we make the, the fuel cell more durable? And this is strongly related to the understanding of how a fuel cell ages. And at the end, um, we uh, investigated strongly uh, the, the effects of this, 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 this uh, degradation. And because of that, uh, we uh, we're lucky to have uh, fleet data in our consortium that we could, uh, so to say, apply on specific accelerated stress tests, which was then created by the Technical University of uh, Munich. And we figured out that three specific accelerated stress tests are um, the most severe in uh, aging the fuel cell. And this is, um, um, we dedicated then uh, the, the so-called voltage cycling, the startup and immediate shutdown and the load and humidity uh, cycling uh, on the fuel cell. Uh, with uh, these test protocols and these tests performed by TU Munich, we then uh, feed it, so to say, our models, <coughs> our performance, mo performance models, uh, which were then improved, so to say, and in parallel, this was, um, um, uh, so to say, good uh, input for the creation of our catalyst uh, development. And uh, with a feedback loop from our catalyst uh, manufacturer, also the extension of the model was being done in terms of degradation of, uh, so to say, bimetallic bi catalysts. In our uh, project, we are aiming to have uh, a specific bimetallic alloy, a platinum copper alloy, which uh, hopefully allows us to, to gain um, um, uh, or to create a cheaper catalyst material and um, a catalyst material with high durability. 
So again, um, we have then created these models, adapted them, and at the end, but we are not that far, uh, we want to uh, perform also durability tests and do a lifetime assessment um, on these models and also of the, of the material. So uh, just an example how these um, uh, so to say, accelerated stress tests are being performed. It's not so easy to translate uh, a specific uh, profile, a speed or a load profile into uh, a specific stack load uh, uh, cycle. And uh, for that, uh, we approached uh, uh, the, or we took the uh, existing vector tool using the speed profile uh, of, these, um, uh, of this tool. Then we uh, considered um, four uh, specific um, profiles, uh, urban, rural, highway, and a climb um, profile and uh, translated them because uh, we have a, a system that is uh, current controlled and we try to con um, converge this into a um, um, uh, voltage control uh, into the fuel cell and this is what we then created we uh, defined a, so to say um, AST matrix uh, with an upper potential level of 0 0.5 volts and roughly 200 uh, K cycles so this is just an example uh, of one of the the uh, accelerated stress tests we uh, created one of the three Okay, but also mentioning then in parallel the, the model framework which has been uh, performed. So the, the idea of these models or the, 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 the need of these models is, uh, uh, as I said, a deep understanding of the degradation. Also um, having um, an extension of these models to our uh, needs of a uh, degradation of a bimetallic uh, catalyst. So this is was not existing yet. We, we do have some experience in, uh, or we do have some models for pure platinum uh, catalysts, but in terms of uh, bimetallic, we we didn't have it <laughs> anyway. So uh, the idea is really we had we had to to apply or we had to adapt these models in specific um, dissolution processes, which happens in in these catalysts. Uh, don't want to go into the into the in depth with that because it's really a deep electrochemistry. But at the end, um, uh, the the severe or the, the most uh, significant um, sort of say issues we have with this bimetallic catalyst is that uh, the copper is uh, um, dissoluting over time and is somehow poisoning the fuel cell. And this is what we want to investigate. This is what we want to mitigate at the end. And um, therefore, we created uh, these models, which shows the process of these dissolutions. And um, these models could have been uh, parameterized and uh, are now working um, accordingly. Um, <clears throat> okay. Um, yes. And another interesting uh, result what we have uh, is also as i said the the work on the catalyst material itself so uh, we uh, in total we had three generations of um, catalysts and uh, what you can see here is the second generation of the catalyst uh, we kind of applied a specific test on this uh, catalyst. It was not uh, recording or uh, in regards to the uh, created accelerated stress test, but this was a more severe one because we wanted, we wanted to have results at, at the end of life of the material. And uh, on the left side, you can see a so-called polymerization curve, which is an indication of the performance of a uh, fuel cell. And um, you can see on the... Um, red dotted uh, line so to say where at the beginning of uh, the tests we could we could see a really good performance so um, the performance at the uh, beginning of the test was was uh, quite uh, significantly good but over time um, there was a drop of performance and we could see um, a so-called as I mentioned um, uh, an anode poisoning uh, due to the dissolution of the copper but 
here's an interesting thing. We then tried uh, to uh, investigate how much copper was on the surface of the, the anode, and we then performed a so-called um, cyclic voltometry to investigate this. And after the first um, cycle, uh, we could see that the uh, this is um, yeah, hard to uh, to explain, but anyway, it's kind of uh, doing an investigation, but also seeing that the copper was uh, in the first um, round of, uh, let me check this, sorry, <laughs> uh, of this uh, cycle was uh, vanished so to say and we could um, we could have seen a regain of the performance of this material so this was really an interesting fact um, but at the end uh, we have uh, some uh, indications that we should definitely or dr dramatically lower the copper content in our uh, catalyst so uh, we are now in the stage of having a third generation. We tried to improve this material uh, in terms of uh, all the, the investigations we did on the, on the second generation and uh, try to sort of resolve these problems. And um, I don't have these results now here of the third generation, but um, we can see that um, the last generation is really performing well. We don't have the durability tests yet, but we are kind uh, of um, yeah, hopeful that this works out also in terms of durability and in the stability of the catalyst itself. So this is um, a significant point. Okay. Um, so, um, we also have some, this is about the results. We also have some ongoing collaborations between um, other uh, research projects. So more specifically, uh, More Life is uh, in uh, discussion with the Real High FC project. It's also a road transport heavy duty application uh, project. And um, we try to provide some, some of these test protocols, what we have created to the Real High FC uh, project and um, once they performed these um, tests uh, hopefully we can get some some results also in time because Molov is <laughs> uh, uh, is coming to an end uh, and provides also the results uh, for for us that we can use then for adapting uh, our, our models for example um, yeah, and also recently the Molov project joined the so-called Aeveto cluster, hi Anje. <laughs> um, so this is um, yeah, a consortium of um, fuel cell or battery related uh, projects uh, where we have, uh, so to say, the, we, we search for some synergies we can, uh, we can find within the projects and we also try to have a common uh, dissemination activities. For example, we will have a joint booth at the TRA uh, in, in Dublin. Okay, um, so about the impacts, uh, we already have one uh, actual impact, impact, which I'm really proud of, we're going to show. Uh, our MEA manufacturer, it's a small company, uh, it's an SME, and uh, during the project it was possible that we have uh, created or we have uh, yeah, allowed them to, to, to ramp up the, the production of their MEAs. Uh, and also in terms of employees, uh, the, the, uh, we had an increase of, of employees uh, during in a period of only four months and um, there was an expansion of their facility uh, which you can see on the right hand side so this is the the midterm impact or the actual impact and now we are aiming uh, to um, the impacts of 2023 so basically uh, we really want to as i said in the beginning to bring the fuel cell technology into the market and uh, this can only be done when you have severe cost reductions and uh, um, a severe uh, increase of the durability of the technology itself and for sure we have to uh, do the industrialization of the, uh, the, the product. So this is um, a really important thing. And um, yeah, so the, as I said, the targeted impact is then uh, strengthen the uh, also the European fuel cell industry. And uh, what we are also trying to do is uh, to increase the collaboration between uh, the acad academia and the industry. And yeah, so 
this is our settled goals, our impact for 2023. And with that, I think I s was able to manage it in, in time. And uh, for more live questions, please contact me <laughs> and try to visit our uh, homepage. It's morelife-info.eu. And thank you. Thank you, thank you very much, Johannes. Very interesting. Thank you also for sticking to the time. So we remain still in the field of the uh, durability of uh, fuel cells with this very evocative name of the project Immortal. And I would like now to invite Deborah Jones, who is the coordinator, to take the floor. Deborah, she's the director of research at CNRS. She has been the author of co-author of more than 250 publications in the sector, as well the inventor of 17 patents related still to fuel cells and electrolyzer materials. And she has also very strong experience as coordinator of projects at the joint undertaking. So please, Deborah, tell us more about the Immortal project. That's, that's what I'm going to do. Thank you very much, okay. Pietro. Uh, so good morning, everybody, and uh, thank you for the introduction. Uh, thank you to the organizers for uh, inviting Immortal to come and present this morning. Um, so I'm going to be talking about the Immortal project, uh, improved lifetime stacks for heavy duty trucks through ultra durable components. So the project has now been going for just over just over three years. Um, we have another month or two to run before before the end of the project. Uh, so let me give you an overview of the of the overall project a presentation with its with its partners uh, ourselves CNRS a national research organization in France um, other research partners uh, at Imtech University of Freiburg and then ind industrial partners Johnson Matthew Bosch FPT industrial and AVL and Protexo is in charge of um, communication activities on the project so we responded to the call for proposals in 2020 uh, we started at the beginning of 2021 um, we're actually a 42 month project uh, now, so we're 90, 95% finished, whatever, whatever that turns out to be. 3.8 uh, contribution in terms of funding from, from the Clean Hydrogen JU. So we're talking about um, heavy duty transport application. Obviously the key requirements are high efficiency uh, and durability. And so I um, expressed uh, those, I don't know if we have a pointer here that works uh, express those here um, so that we that the um, the target in in terms of performance um, in the corporate proposals was to to reach 1.2 watts per square centimeter at 0.6.75 volts um, the 1.2 watts per square centimeter is not in itself uh, a massive issue it's it's lower than um, than we had worked on previously or the targets in previous automotive light duty vehicle projects such as inspire volumetric or Gaia uh, where the um, the performance target in terms of power density was 1.5 or even 1.8 watts per square centimeter uh, but the point is that it's at a higher voltage because we're looking for higher efficiency um, so that actually then uh, is is um, is this is this point here so this is the one of the um, polarization curves that we obtained in the framework of the inspire project you can see that that immortal beginning of life target is just above in in fact that polarization curve there uh, at the um, current density of 1.78 uh, amps per square centimeter um, so that to say that it was uh, beyond uh, the state of the art at the beginning of the project in terms of the lifetime the target uh, in the call for proposals was actually 30,000 hours uh, that was actually um, beyond the the SRIA target which was um, developed subsequently which was 20,000 hours for 2024 so 30,000 hours um, if we look at that beginning of life target then on on the left hand on the right hand side then here that's a beginning of life target and if we say that 10% degradation then represents the lifetime take 10% off uh, of, the, of that voltage there and then our end of life uh, voltage is going to be 0 0.608 volts at that current density which gives an average uh, decay rate of only two microvolts per hour um, so that's obviously a very low degradation rate so beyond state-of-the-art performance and a very low degradation rate are our challenges um, so how do we go about this by having extremely um, highly performing consortium I must say uh, all partners interacted extremely well together lots and lots of collaboration uh, but these are the main pillars then of the activity from left to right uh, so developing load profile tests 
um, I'm going to call it LPT for heavy duty, uh, MEA uh, in particular, performance and durability assessment. Um, we have to develop those MEAs, so we need components that are specifically designed for high durability and high performance. That's the second block. And then we validate those then using these accelerated stress test and uh, load profile test protocols. Equally, um, there was no intention ever to actually test out to 30,000 hours of operation. So on the basis of uh, what we could derive from um, the uh, degradation profile, profiles using AST and LPT protocols, then uh, to develop algorithms for lifetime prediction to see to what extent we would actually achieve 30,000 hours of operation. And ultimately, of course, to achieve the targets in terms of performance uh, and, and efficiency in particular, but, but also calculation on the cost. So we have some of the main uh, milestones that are indicated there as, as the blue spots along the bottom. Um, so let me show you some of the results that we've attained during the course of the project. I'll be talking just a little bit about some of the components, the catalyst and the membrane. I'll talk about the, the CCM, I'll talk about the lifetime prediction. Um, and where we are overall in terms of the performance. So here's one slide on development at, at Johnson Matthey on uh, dialloid platinum cobalt catalyst supported on carbons. I'm not going to go into any details of, of the preparation, but I just want to point out that Johnson Matthey developed a whole range of different carbons uh, of different um, uh, catalysts and with the platinum cobalt actually supported on these different carbons with some of the specifics given there. Uh, and in the testing carried out, this is on 50 square centimeter cells, uh, the platinum cobalt whether on uh, air or, or oxygen, uh, simply for calculation of uh, the mass activity, but you can see the more highly performing um, both at low and high current densities than the standard uh, platinum on, on carbon material. Um, moving on to, to the membrane. Um, so the membrane uses uh, a, a nanofiber uh, a development, a nanofiber web that we've developed in our labs at CNRS is now, is now scaled up. Um, this is showing an accelerated stress test on uh, one of these membranes. You can see that it's scaled up up here. So this is the, the composite membrane containing the PFSA ionomer, containing the, the nanofiber web reinforcement. It's a 10 micron membrane. Um, what, what I'm showing here at the top is the OCV degradation uh, and at the bottom showing uh, the, the, essentially the gas, the gas crofer, crossover. So it's the response to a small uh, pressure, pressure, differ, pressure differential at, at the anode. Um, so the accelerated stress test is uh, the cell is being held at 90 degrees uh, C. Um, it, it, there's a wet dry, wet dry cycling um, uh, at open circuit voltage hold. So we're testing both for mechanical and chemical stability of that membrane uh, as it's being held in the, in the membrane electrode assembly. So this is the reference uh, MEA with the same, absolutely the same construction, but a different kind of uh, reinforcement standard PTFE reinforcement. This is the immortal membrane with a nanofiber type um, non-PFSA, uh, non-fluorinated uh, uh, reinforcement. Uh, and in fact, we stopped the test here, or Johnson Matthews stopped the test here at 100 120,000 of these AST cycles, which actually corresponds to, in real life, um, more than 2,000 hours of actual AST testing uh, with no rupture failure. Uh, we can see that there's a bit of a thinning here. Um, you can see that through the, 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 the drop in the OCV, but there's, there's no catastrophic failure. The membrane is, is holding out. Um, it's also interesting to see that for uh, membranes of, of, of exactly the same thickness, that we're also using a less reinforcement material uh, with uh, the um, uh, nanofiber reinforcement than in the case of the, the PTFE reinforcement. So how does that all come together then in terms of the CCM uh, and the performance in, in the fuel cell? Um, so here we have uh, results from, from the testing at Johnson Mathy and at Bosch. Uh, we have uh, three essentially generations of, of CCM or, or membrane electrode assembly. This was our baseline. This was generation one. This was generation two. This is in terms of uh, the power density. Uh, at that uh, 1.78 um, amps per square centimeter spot. So you can see that we've been gradually in improving in terms of the performance. Uh, but notably as well, um, Johnson Matthey has been using far less uh, platinum. There's been a lot of platinum thrifting. So improvement uh, uh, with regard to the amount of platinum that, that's the, and, and in fact generally noble metals that are incorporated into those CCMs. So going down from 0.84 um, grams uh, of platinum per kilowatt down to 0.36. Uh, so that's a significant Im Im improvement. 
Um, so that's what's written up there. Uh, these CCMs were tested in both short uh, subscales, so, so small single cells or, or single cells, 50 square centimeters, but also full size short cell, uh, short stacks um, for a total of, in fact, over 7,000 hours, once again, without any catastrophic failure. So let me show you that. Um, but first, let me tell you all about the, um, the low profile test development. So uh, uh, important work that was done on actually um, what is the low profile that we use to actually test these CCMs that we've developed. Uh, so we're talking about uh, truck activity, truck usage, um, obviously diff many different kinds of profiles that could be used for that. Our original intention was actually to use uh, real life data from fuel cell trucks that actually wasn't possible during the course of the project. Um, but it was possible at AP FPT to have real life mission profiles from different kinds of trucks. Um, and that, that work was to simulate uh, different drive cycles. In fact, more than 450 drive cycles were actually simulated. Uh, and then uh, the extraction of the, of the stack load profiles and the selection of the load profiles from testing, a lot of work between uh, FPT and, and Bosch. Those load profiles were then uh, processed uh, to enable their usage actually uh, in terms of a modal load profile test uh, that we could actually use for testing, for testing our stack. Um, in, in parallel, th there's the work uh, done in collaboration between Bosch and Imtech on um, accelerated stress testing on single cells, load profile testing on single cells, on uh, short stacks as well for AST and LPT. So that gives us the uh, acceleration factor in, in terms of um, between the AST and the LPT, but, but also the scaling between what happens in a single cell and what happens in a stack. So with the application of, of, of all of that, and I've already told you that uh, in total there were more than uh, 7,000 hours of, of, of load profile testing then carried out on different generations of, of short stacks. Uh, we used an initial load profile test on uh, our baseline MEAs and also on our Gen 1 MEAs. We then uh, used that improved load profile test that I've just told you about to, to test subsequent generations of, of MEAs. But the message here really is, is that in total more than 7,000 uh, of test hours of testing, two different sets of uh, stack hardware, in fact, Bosch stack hardware, but also AVL stack hardware, um, and these initial and improved uh, LPT <coughs> protocols. Uh, this shows you here then the improvements during the course of the lifetime at that 1.78 uh, amps per square centimeter point, moving up from the baseline uh, up to uh, generation um, generation one uh, is, the, is the green line there, uh, and the, the ultimate target point, which is, which is that one there. So all of this uh, AST and LPT testing, of course, generates a lot of data. Uh, what we discovered was that the degradation is essentially due to uh, platinum dissolution, uh, loss of the electrochemical surface area of the catalyst. Um, so that was uh, determined experimentally. That was also modeled. Um, and uh, using these inf this information uh, and uh, following the development then of uh, lifetime prediction algorithms, uh, the work done at Bosch, uh, was actually able, to, first of all, to uh, model the, the baseline voltage loss here um, using uh, having uh, having used and all of the information on the ECS, ECSA loss uh, actually determined during the uh, AST experiments. Uh, and then I mentioned earlier on that our, our criterion is, is to um, achieve only, let's say, or, or maintain 90% uh, of, of the voltage at 1.78 amps per square centimeter. Uh, and extending that uh, lifetime prediction out to 30,000 hours does actually show that in principle that would be obtained. Um, so that's, that's a very interesting result uh, that's obtained actually with the, with the baseline uh, MEA, um, 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 with the baseline MEAs, that they would actually achieve uh, the full 30,000 hours were we actually to test out for that period of time. Um, so this uh, summarizes really what, what we've done. Uh, it, I've talked about uh, the new membrane architecture with this novel reinforcement, uh, thin membranes, 10 micron membranes uh, that allow a very high durability, no rupture failure, high mass activity, high mass activity alloy catalysts uh, developed on, on novel carbons that uh, uh, certainly show uh, an increase in the beginning of life uh, performance on the MEAs. Very significant PGM thrifting, so uh, reducing the amount of, of platinum and other PGMs uh, included uh, in, in the MEAs, um, reducing uh, the amount of PGMs by, by more than a half, by more than a factor two, let's say, is, is a better way of saying. 
several short stack iterations, uh, actually integrating the new materials. It's often difficult to do that within the framework of a, the period of a, of, a, of a project. Time goes by very quickly, but uh, we were able to do that quite successfully to prepare these uh, different short stacks. Uh, and then uh, obviously extremely important was all of the end of life testing on the baseline MEAs, actually to show what was uh, the problem with regard to, to degradation, uh, to feed that into the algorithms that I've talked about, but also to improve materials. Um, important work done on developing these load profile test protocols because we need to know uh, what are the relevant conditions actually for testing uh, our single cells and our stacks um, and then bringing all of these results together for the lifetime prediction. Um, so th there are remaining gaps. Um, perhaps I'll, I'll add two remaining gaps into what's written, written up there. So certainly a gap actually in being able to use uh, real life data from, from fuel cell trucks uh, that we can uh, use then to actually validate our experimental results. Uh, that's, uh, that, that's missing. I think we also need to know to what extent the management system uh, is going to influence the, the, the lifetime of the CCMs that we have. So the size of the battery, the, the, the voltage limits and so on uh, are also important factors. Uh, gaps that are missing at the present time. Um, what we showed is, is that with our, our baseline MEA, that in, in principle we can reach uh, the lifetime target of 30,000 hours. Those are, are, are not the most performing, uh, highly performing, that uh, fall short uh, by about 30 millivolts at the um, 1.78 watts uh, amps per square centimetre point. Uh, so they fall short a little bit, they would achieve the lifetime. On the other hand, we, we could achieve the power density targets, targets with alloy catalysts, but then on that side, uh, the, the, um, the durability is, is not achieved. So a gap in actually achieving both the beginning of life um, power density and also the durability at the same time. But I think having, uh, in principle, achieved the lifetime uh, with, uh, with an immortal MEA is a very significant result. Uh, and I think longer term as well, there's clearly going to be uh, a challenge to close the durability and performance gap uh, if we're moving on to fluorine-free MEAs. So the project partners will use the results uh, in, in, in uh, various ways. Uh, CNRS, GM and Bosch are continuing to work together on uh, materials developments in the framework of the Highlander project. Um, JM is uh, going to move forward uh, with uh, use of these components in their new MEA products. Um, there's been a lot of methodology development and, and simulation methodology development. Uh, so methodology standardization for LPT development at Bosch, simulation methodology and lifetime prediction tools uh, at uh, FPT. Um, and uh, yeah, I think I've just about been, been, through, been through that one. Uh, so lots of application areas, both for the research partners and for the industrial partners. Uh, and, and finally, just to mention uh, that um, uh, we responded at the, at the beginning to uh, um, invitation from Mission Innovation to, to actually interact with a project in, in the United States, a million mile fuel cell truck uh, project. Uh, we have regular two monthly meetings actually with that grouping uh, that generally gathers around about 60 uh, different uh, participants uh, from the US, from Japan uh, and, and from Europe who are um, all working on um, fuel cell truck heavy duty applications generally. And so thank you. Thank you, thank you very much, Deborah. Very interesting and encouraging results. So I would like now to move on with the third speaker. We are changing a little bit the topic, the subject. And uh, Federico Zenit, who is a senior researcher scientist at Sintef. He has more than 20 years of experience in the field and uh, his night job is to uh, be the coordinator of the joint undertaking projects and one of them is Stash and uh, we're looking forward to hear about it. Please Federico. Thank you very much Pietro for the introduction. Yes, uh, uh, we started the project more live and then immortal and we discussed with my colleagues but maybe my approach to here should have a name of uh, like coffin or something uh, but I'm going to be talking about boxes in, a, in the case in a few slides but it's actually about um, standard. We are not really that low TRL in this project. So uh, in, for the overall presentation, it's a pretty big consortium we have in this project. Uh, uh, budget is uh, pretty respectable, over 14 uh, million euros. Uh, at the center, we have several research institutions, my own Sintef in Norway, and then FEV in Germany, TNO in Netherlands, uh, CA in France, and uh, Butterstoffnet, which is the Hydrogen Association of Benelux. Yeah, sure. And then we have uh, OEM side, uh, representing buses, uh, construction equipment, uh, trucks, uh, uh, ships, inland ships, uh, ocean-going ships, uh, uh, 
automotive powertrains and trains uh, so we got pretty much everything moving on uh, the surface so <laughs> then we have several names for fuel cell manufacturers uh, we got most of the industry i uh, would uh, dare say uh, so nuvere intelligent energy plastic company used to be known as aaron klinger and uh, as a uh, fronius um, freudenberg uh, protomoto toyota and ballard and uh, this is consortium then we also have external observers so you can see this getting pretty crowded got very well known names like airbus uh, uh, bosch uh, hyundai uh, and so behind cell centric is also daimler in addition to volvo again so crowded so what are all these people doing uh, is working towards uh, a standard will kickstart uh, fuel cells in the heavy duty sector and why do we want standard well the main reason uh, behind uh, the uh, concept of having a standard was that uh, one of our partners, VDL, had to, to rebuild their buses several times over every time they got a new stack from uh, their vendors. And they were getting quite tired of that because they had to rebuild the chassis every time. So I said, let's have a fixed size and then why not standardize everything we need to standardize. The idea is then to pull several uh, of these uh, markets. Uh, when you are building light duty vehicles like cars, you can, if you are a successful car, you can build millions of it. But uh, that's not the case for heavy duty. You're not going to build uh, millions uh, of trucks or ships. Uh, so th the markets are necessarily going to be smaller. But if you pull them together, building all the same kind of system, then you can still achieve uh, economies of scale, which means it's easier to achieve automation, which then will start a positive feedback loop uh, with uh, even greater economies of scale. Uh, these will also allow uh, competition among fuel cell uh, manufacturers because the uh, best example I have uh, is uh, the deal Alstom had with Hydrogenics a few years back to make their trains. Then you have uh, the engineers of Hydrogenics, the engineers of Alstom working together for several years and building a system. Then it's very difficult if one day Alstom wants to buy uh, their fuel cells from uh, Ballard, the Proton Motor, whoever else uh, to just replace them because then they would uh, need uh, to decouple themselves from a system instead if we have a standard it's a lot easier if uh, uh, your a vendor is bought uh, by some hostile company or simply decides to go on their uh, way to buy from some other supplier these will also increase their ability in supply chain if uh, your fuel cell breaks you take it out with uh, the one system plug in another system that's all and all this will then have the incentive from economic point of view for end users it's going to be easier for them to operate fuel cells it's going to be cheaper it's going to be easier to maintain but it's also going to be easier for oems to go into fuel cells before you had to get all your engineers to get the engineers of the fuel cell supplier and uh, work with them for for years possibly now you simply know where the, the um, in, what the interface is where the line goes and that's what you have to provide and eventually these will allow to scale these uh, to uh, well the project has a target to one megawatt but uh, in principle it doesn't need to stop there and this way then again you come back to the market pooling so uh what have we achieved i promise boxes here they are um so we have uh, uh, the first size form of standard is the most critical for OEMs. So this is really important. If it, the next the fuel cell it does not uh, fit the previous hole you had in the previous chassis, then you have to rebuild the chassis, and then you start uh, going to, down to a rabbit hole of uh, um, recertification, homologation, and uh, a process that can take years. So you want the things to fit where they're supposed to. Uh, we ended up with uh, this. Uh, th mm, three base cuboid shapes a b and c uh, the we photo over every millimeter in here we start with a basic unit of 340 millimeters which represent the height of this cuboid then the width is little more than two that's because somebody really wanted last two centimeters so we thought about this much that's how hard it was so it's uh, 700 millimeters wide and then the lengths are three, four, and five times uh, the basic unit. And that defines A, B, and C. Of course, there is no D because that would simply be two A's in, uh, in a row. Uh, also, there's a standard by which if you double the letter, it means that you're stacking up ports. So there's double A, double B, double uh, triple B, which are popular sizes for now. So A, B, A, A, and B, B are popular because they fit exactly uh, in the place of fuel tanks in uh, European trucks. 
and the triple B in the engine bay of European trucks. European trucks are very important because they're a very large market and they're very compact, com especially compared to American trucks. So that's why a lot of uh, the standard come from there. <coughs> Then, uh, the physical interface. You want also to standardize where hydrogen is coming in, where air is coming in, where the coolant is coming in and out. And uh, in general, neither OEMs nor fuel cell manufacturers were interested in having a specific point with a specific connector. They were much more concerned in having a general area. It's pretty easy to move uh, a pipe uh, of a few centimeters. What is difficult if the pipe has to go all the way around the box? That's, uh, uh, that would be a problem. There are some exceptions. For the most important exception is uh, power. Doesn't really matter power cable you can bend around, but what is uh, really important is where the hydrogen is coming in and out, uh, air and coolant. Then, uh, third part of three, digital interface. Uh, uh, is this is the fine on top of Canvas, but it's also um, implementable over Ethernet. And it was actually the uh, maritime uh, OEMs who were more interested in uh, Ethernet. Um, automotive were happy with CAN. Signals are defined according to existing standard, SAE J in 1939. We actually contact uh, SAE, we are in dialogue with them for to include our modifications to the, to the uh, standard. Uh, more than modifications, additions. The state machine is not too complicated, uh, it represented there, and there is also possibility of having a, a hierarchy of fuel cell modules. That's more important, especially for maritime and uh, trains, large applications. And you can have uh, all of them uh, managed by a single controller, or you can have uh, one of them acting as a leader on followers. Again, we don't have a specific connector, just like for uh, the physical interfaces. It needs to have 18 pins, but that's all the requirements. Pretty easy in a workshop to change uh, whatever connector you have. And then, well, of course, a lot of uh, EU project uh, defined standards. The problem was that then uh, after the final standard, that was just a bunch of papers. So they required us this, and that's why we have a bigger budget. <laughs> they required us to start building these prototypes to prove that we actually can, actually can do it. Uh, we're going to build eight. Uh, they, there have been some deviations from the standard, mostly because the standard unit project has been a moving target, and so we have had some tolerance, but all fuel cell manufacturers are uh, going to provide final designs, and they will be public, and you will be able, in one year from now, to go up to them and say, I want this one uh, for my project. Most popular sizes, we have seen A, AA, and B. Uh, we haven't seen a triple B yet, we, and we haven't seen a C, even though the C size uh, was supposed to be popular with buses to be installed on roofs, but apparently B is just as good. The most popular uh, power level is about 100 kilowatts, so in a higher range. Uh, some uh, are down to 36, some up to 125. These modules all include the air compressor, uh, hydrogen recycling, uh, all the coolant pumps, uh, um, control module and exhaust. They don't include, of course, the hydrogen storage, as that's somewhere else, uh, and air filters and heat sinks. And the DC-DC converter may or may not be inside. We had a lot of discussion whether the DC-DC had to be included or not. Uh, we concluded that it's something that uh, it's better is not fixed in the, in the standard. There are some cases where it's useful to have it when you have only one unit. If you, in maritime especially, you don't want to have the DC inside because you're going to have a separate unit for that. Testing, yes, we have built this and that uh, uh, truck runs uh, in the Netherlands. Uh, this truck was also the hydrogen week um, in uh, Brussels last year. Uh, it's a um, truck built by VDL with uh, two uh, separate A-sized uh, uh, units built by Plastic Omni, you can see the, the logo. And then we have uh, uh, two testing rigs uh, in the like, in lower picture. Uh, fortunately for uh, um, intellectual property reasons, it's, uh, you can't, cannot see the, uh, uh, the actual uh, unit there, but uh, these are not being deployed at uh, CEA. We are gonna start uh, within, uh, I think uh, next week, uh, a new round of testings. Uh, test protocols uh, will be published, um, they're still waiting to, to, to clear that. Uh, and there will also be some on-field tests with, with a genset that VDL has decided to build. And also VDL has decided to extend this to SOFCs. Uh, we assume the uh, PAM throughout, but actually this is the same technology can be, a, the standard can be applied to SOFCs. So, impacts. 
Well, uh, of course, uh, in one year from now, you'll be able to ask uh, this uh, uh, fuel cell manufacturer to provide you these modules with this standard. We'll also submit the standard to various bodies. Uh, we already di in dialogue with SAE, and then we'll follow up with ISE ISO. We are um, uh, going to see then, and we have a lot of FCM suppliers, of course. Uh, we have a, a representative section of OEMs, uh, and so we have a significant uh, starting market, and hopefully this market will expand. This will make it easier for OEMs to start developing their hydrogen vehicles and the lower barriers for competition already in the short term. And ideally, this will give impetus to economies of scale, which means that in the longer term impact, well, we all know that uh, heavy duty is more difficult to fire than uh, light duty with batteries, and hydrogen can solve this, uh, but the hydrogen also needs scale. Um, Batteries are piggybacking on uh, the greatest infrastructure that ever was, the electric grid. Hydrogen does not have that. So we need scale in order to build this infrastructure. Stash will achieve the, um, mel uh, this, like, a melting pot of all these uh, markets. And this will show then that zero emission uh, heavy duty is feasible. That's not a pipe dream. And this then will hopefully encourage politicians to declare a year for zero emission heavy duty, just like uh, they're all discussing about zero emission uh, cars uh, uh, cut off uh, uh, dates. Uh, Norway is supposed to be next year, actually. We'll see how it, that's going to work out. Yeah, that was all for me. Thank you very much for your attention. Okay, thanks for the presentation again, and um, I think we have sufficient time left for all the questions that may have come up during um, the presentations we had. Um, may to start the Q&A session, I have one initial question also regarding the STASH project, because it was the last uh, presentation we had. Um, you proposed multiple yeah, box designs for, uh, for the fuel cell systems. Um, the first question that directly come to my mind when you were talked about the requirements. Was there something regarding power density that was um, relevant for for your for your design, let's say. So um. you cannot imagine how many times we discussed that and <laughs> <laughs> uh, eventually, we decided to leave uh, power density out. Uh, it's something that uh, the fuel cell manufacturer will need to provide. Uh, some uh, applications require significant power density, some other not so much, like for example, gen sets. Uh, that very much depends what you're powering. So, in short, uh, no, it's not part of the standard. Okay, thanks a lot. So, maybe now I'll hand over to the audience. If there are some questions, um, just feel free to raise your hand and then Xavier will hand over the microphone uh, to you. Okay. So. <laughs> Sorry. I'll start off. I'll start off then. Simon Edwards from Ricardo. Just to follow up on that exact point about power density not being in there. I also saw in Stash that you've not considered marine applications or large-scale marine applications, is that correct? Uh, no, we have them. Everything moving on the surface of the planet uh, is included. We okay. don't have planes, right. we don't have submarines. Great. So if you needed a megawatt system mm -hmm. and you followed your standardization mechanism, how much space compared to a bespoke system would you lose? Let's, let's, let's sort of ask it that way instead. That's a power density type of question. But if you're having to stack up 10 of your 100 uh, kilowatt systems, how much bigger would it be than a bespoke system? Uh, well, not necessarily much bigger, but then again, uh, we haven't uh, run as projections. That's an interesting question. Uh, it uh, uh, yeah, dep remains to be seen how much uh, is the pressure for you to uh, have uh, everything packed in uh, neatly. So you can, uh, when you have a, a maritime system with several, uh, it's a very modular technology, so you want to be able to extract these modules uh, uh, and for, uh, for maintenance, uh, so you have to weigh several things. Yeah, I don't have a straight answer for that, I'm afraid. Something to consider, yeah, thank you. 
Well, I guess we have the second question. Um, is, was that already answered with? Uh, okay. So I'll give you. Okay, we have one in the front row. Vincent Matalan from Toyota Motor Europe. I have a question for Deborah. Um, the during the testing, I assume you have used ultra pure hydrogen. While in reality, when the trucks are driving, there could be impurities, maybe below the threshold from EN 17124. But uh, is, was it also considered in your plan to test the uh, systems at the threshold level of the EN standard of hydrogen purity? No, I mean that's obviously an excellent point, but it but it isn't something that was actually part of of, um, of the scope of the of the of the, of the work. Uh, neither, in fact, within the call for proposal originally, in fact, uh, or, or something that we were able to do, uh, you know, in in in, in the project. But um, something that you know we we'll have to handle in in subsequent work. I think. Okay, maybe I have a follow follow up question regarding. Um, the more uh, the early TRL projects. Um, so both of your projects had um, those um, load profile tests uh, that you developed, and I think uh, well for all of us uh, being researchers, it's h quite hard to get real driving data of future trucks, of course. But it's also difficult to get driving data of existing diesel trucks. <laughs> so um, how did you handle that? Uh, I think in Immortal you got at least some data for for your simulation, but uh, yeah. Was it uh, sufficient enough, or did you have to make some estimations for for your profiles? Yes, so, so we were very lucky uh, in having FPT in, in, the, in the project, um, uh, and so uh, we were. Uh, in fact, uh, in that part of the work, there was simulation of, of 450 different types of, uh, of profile, so different types of trucks on different kinds of missions in different kinds of conditions. Um, and from those, then, we ultimately selected four uh, that we thought would be um, most representative and um, included those in the final modal load profile test that we used uh, with different weightings. Um, so we, we think that you know that it's obviously some kind of generalized load profile. It's not specific to to um, a specific to any particular usage. Um, but yeah, never, nevertheless, was um, I think a step forward from the the initial one uh, that that we were using. But clearly, yeah, I mean, we'd be, it'd be very good as I as I said in you know in one of the remaining gaps actually to have. Um, that, that data actually from fuel cell trucks with the particular mission um, to, to enable to see actually how our materials and stacks and MEAs actually uh, stand up with, you know, under those real conditions. But yes, I mean, to respond to, to, to really reply to the question that we did have access to, 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 to actual mission data uh, and they were used um, as an important part of the work in improving our load profile testing. Yeah, to add something at least, <laughs> uh, we were lucky to have uh, EKPO on board and uh, due to the uh, relations with the customers, we were able to, to get these, these profiles, yeah. Okay, maybe just one uh, quick follow-up to that um, and the, the impact of at least the four scenarios, for example, the model that you have for the stress test in the end. Um, did you see a huge impact on the different use cases for the for the cell durability, or is it like not really relevant which use case you actually pick in the end for the durability? I'm sorry, I didn't quite catch the question. Uh, so you you said you had 450 different mission profiles um, yes. you you selected, and from the, those 450, you picked four for the real tests of the fuel cells or the stacks that you had, um, and when. You, I don't know if you have just piled those four and had them after each other, or did you had, had, have had a comparison of each individual stress test after one another? Okay. So, in fact, what we did was to so we picked those 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 four, um, and then as, as I said, they were so that they were integrated into a modal LPT. So we had parts of, of or we had each of those um, uh, let's say profiles integrated with different weightings into our final LPT. So they weren't used individually, but but collectively. Yeah. Thanks again. Okay. I think we have one question from Tilo. Morning. Thank you very much for the interesting presentation. I have a 
question to the um, both first project on the durability. Do you expect any impact on the lifetime and durability of the fusel stacks um, caused by vibrations, shocks, mechanical loadings? Yeah, I mean, it's uh, all I can answer is it's not something that we did. Uh, it's not something that we did in in the project. Um, well, in, you know, it, I think that the purpose of Im of Immortal really was to develop the components and and try and show those components in in functional and durable MEAs uh, and and in the stack under particular conditions. Then beyond that, you know, it's, uh, once again, uh, the, uh, the, the next step, I think, to actually to see to what extent it's, it, the durability is affected by, by other effects. Yeah, I, I understood that you were not covering it, but you wanted to know your opinion if it becomes relevant or not. Yeah. Uh, you want to continue the answer? Uh, actually, uh, um, I don't think it's, it's uh, that important to have these mechanical stress tests. Uh, on our material, um, no. So the answer is no. <laughs> Thanks, <coughs> Peter Brainy. A, a question also to the third, to the stash project. Kind of an outlook, maybe kind of lessons learned. Uh, my standardization of the modules as boxes um, is certainly helpful. But if we look at conventional powertrains, most of the standardization is in the in the in the is we say in the fuel cell a world balance of plants components right like i mean injectors or pumps or i mean turbo blowers or whatever so uh, have you discussed in the consortium as a kind of a step also to 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 have common parts like this to, to have a, a, a similar approach as in conventional powertrain system yeah Thank you. Uh, it's an interesting question that. And uh, first off, in Stash, we uh, do not standardize the single BOP components because uh, we decided early on that we would treat the diffuser modules as a black box. And that's because we have all these uh, co competing companies in the consortium, and none of them want. Uh, of course the others uh, to have a peek at what they are doing so whenever we move around these uh, boxes then nobody is supposed to open them uh, and uh, they're supposed to always be under the eyes of the, their own companies that said uh, I think there is currently a um, an open call of was a 3.1 so uh, in uh, clean hydrogen undertaking so if you're interested in that I suggest uh, start looking for partners I guess someone has another uh, good question. Thank you, and thank you to all the speakers for answering all of these questions. My first question was a bit off piste it was on marine rather than uh, on road transport. My next question is going to be a bit the same. Apologies about that. But in your considerations for lifetime, etc., did you include any aspects of the off highway applications of these fuel cells in vehicles that are essentially on highway vehicles that are modified for off highway? also given the considerations that some people are proposing hydrogen internal combustion engines for that market because of the durability aspects uh, how do your fuel cells react and what are the prospects in the off-highway machine industry uh, applications thank you Yeah, but yeah, I mean, I, I, I can say that from a materials development point of view, that there's there's a lot of work that would be directly applicable, of course, to to fuel cells in other applications. Um, so, I th you know, if, if we're talking about, you know, we, we already showed in Immortal that uh, we think that we're achieving the thirty thousand hours of operation under the particular conditions of the LPT that we were using there. So, different test profiles and uh, and different objectives, of course, in terms of performance in different applications. But, but nevertheless, I think all of this learning on on how to create whether it's more durable MEAs or catalysts or, or catalyst layers or whatever it is, uh, correct strictly applicable as well to, to other application areas with with then uh, adjustments for specificities. Well, maybe I can just add to that, that uh, specifically with this course, maybe we are really looking at the MEA, we are really focusing on the durability going to the materials, but then we have other courses in our programs which are complementing this knowledge. So for example, now we just started a project which is looking at the non-road mobile machineries, where we are really looking at the fuel cell 
system integration into excavator or shredders machineries that we have not been dealing with normally and in that case for example we are looking at the impact of dust vibrations so really the idea is to build these building blocks put together the specific knowledge that we are getting here and there from the different projects and then every once in a while we have the demo projects where we put them all together as we had with Inspire in the past so you take the best in class type of uh, components and you see how they actually work together to make sure that the interaction between the different active components is going in the right direction so maybe with uh, more life and immortal we didn't mean to you know like complete do the whole uh, thing but then we also transport mode types of uh, projects which are more looking at the specific also demands be that aviation maritime with the humid uh, conditions so at program level we are trying to complement okay. with all of these things Just like something, Simon, and maybe as a clarification, maybe Pietro can say even more. Uh, remember that uh, the fuel cells joint undertaking is only focusing on fuel cells, of course. So, you know, I know maybe just for the audience, there is no possibility to fund anything which is related to internal combustion engine and hydrogen because that's outside of the scope. And just to be clear, thanks. Maybe one question regarding the fuel cell degradation from someone who is not anymore any as deep involved in fuel cell development just for the sake of security. Uh, purity of air and uh, hydrogen, which means pollutants in both of the of the gases. To what ex I mean, we we have heard a lot about uh, about platinum degradation and 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 copper or whatever. But on the gas side, uh, to what extent? Or how, how critical is that today or is that with the hydrogen available plant to be available or the air filtering is that solved the issue which was not in the past as well as the condition <laughs> So yeah. what I can say, sorry, let me just jump in here. We have these, um, you know, these hydrogen standards used in, in, in fuel cells, right? And um, uh, we didn't um, consider any uh, real time, so to say, environment uh, impacts on the gas side, at least on the more, uh, more life project. So this is what I uh, cannot answer. <laughs> was more a question for Deborah maybe on, ah, the very, okay. on the very chemical, <laughs> deep chemical side. Okay. Yeah, um, you know, once again, uh, uh, similar question to the question from a colleague in the front from Toyota. Um, uh, and we, we didn't do it in, in, in Immortal, it wasn't part of the project. But, um, you know, other projects, we have looked at the effect of impurities, anode side, yeah. cathode side, it's obviously very important uh, and to be taken into consideration. But uh, yeah, it's not something that we did that we did here. Would it actually affect the catalyst degradation? Um, uh, and it, uh, it, it could do, depends what it depends what it is. You know, there are all, all kinds of absorption effects that can occur. To, po to poison the catalyst, as, uh, as you know. Um, so yeah, but once again, it's difficult to be precise here because it's not something that we did. But nevertheless, you know, it's, it's in our area of interest um, and, and, and being done. Yeah. Yeah, and if I can just complement very quickly, also on the side of the infrastructure, we also have projects which are really dedicated to always keep the purity of the hydrogen as it, as it should be. So for example, when we're looking at the different technologies for compression, the purity is always one of the aspects we are considering. And also we have a project now which is actually looking specifically at the purity of hydrogen. So we are doing a sampling of all the HRS that are active right now, and we are really going to measure what is the purity of hydrogen to make sure that it's always as it's supposed to be. So of course we need to know what happens if in Purity goes in there, but we try to prevent that. Like the same as you wouldn't like to have water in your gasoline when you fill your tank. So, Martin Lehmann from Mann and Hummel, thank you for asking that question about the cathode air filters. And Petro, thank you for mentioning the H2MAC project. And we are 
looking there as well as the cathode air filter and, and purities and uh, that's a project where we look at the adsorption so there are some projects but it's usually a smaller part in these projects to look at we have some national projects but it would be a nice interesting topic for the future thank you Oh, Simon, maybe I, I have another question in between. <laughs> um, so again, for the for the uh, cell colleagues, a question. Um, it's really uh, really the end of project question, maybe. So when you look at the results you have for the new materials and the cell stacks <coughs> and the stacks you developed, um, in your opinion, um, when looking at the heavy duty application compared to the passenger car application. Um, is that heavy duty application may be more tolerance towards a slower system response in comparison to a passenger car sector or did you have different experience here? Okay, well, I will try. <laughs> Maybe, uh, well, we didn't again not really focus on uh, on on this specific um, uh, question but i would say um yes uh, focus was um, roads on and heavy transportation and uh, with with that respect i would say um i would assume yeah that the, the um, um how to say um it is easier to uh, to implement our technology but also uh, in terms of uh, hybridization concepts and i think this is really important that we have a good um, operating strategy here uh, this these um, um, issues can be solved quite easily yeah in using a, a really good hybrid hybridization strategy yeah and uh, this is my opinion on that <laughs> Thank you. Just trying to keep the conversation going, especially thinking about the link then from all of the low TRL activities that we've got here and then applying them onto the heavy duty vehicles. Thank you for more life that you're involved now in the Avito cluster. That's very good to hear. Has there been any interaction in relation to Stash and the Avito cluster? I'm particularly thinking also not about the tractor unit applications, but also the trailer unit applications as well and the comparison with your boxes, etc. There has not, uh, but uh, we can fix that. Yeah. Good. <laughs> yeah, sorry, just one quick question still for you, Federico. So I think you showed at the beginning of the presentation of a rather impressive consortium. Uh, you have a big chunk of the market of the fuel cell suppliers and also a heavy participation from the OEM. So we came up with the standards, we are testing now the prototypes. When the project finished, mission accomplished or not? What are the next steps then really to get the buying on the industry to make these standards really the standard to make sure that everybody follow up? What is your feeling? Also, well, I, I see there is a lot of interest uh, in uh, the industry for for the standard. But we get uh, from OEMs. Uh, we keep getting people sometimes also from uh, from other continents say, "Can we join the project?" That's not how it works. Sorry, uh, but uh, uh, on one hand, uh, we recently okay. You don't know, but uh, Pietro is uh, my project officer, and he probably has nightmares with all the amendments and sending him. Uh, <laughs> there's, it's a big consortium. There is a restructuring here. There's, a, um, in one of these amendments, we added uh, the requirement that, that uh, all fuel cell manufacturers have to pre present a public deliverable with a final design, so they cannot hide and say no, it's not ready. It's going to be ready. It's going to be designed and it's going to be public so everyone will see that uh, they can order this at the, the end of the project that's going to be uh well there is a man and running so it's going to be the end of december uh and uh, also one thing we want to do is to set up some sort of uh, uh, permanent uh, stash uh, uh, maintenance group from based in the industry it's uh, still a bit hazy idea exactly how we're gonna uh, implement that but of course uh, someone we have to maintain the the, the standard after the project uh, but it, it's a bit early to decide yet hi i have small questions about the long-term uh, cost efficient 
impact between electrification and hydrogen. So do you still think hydrogen can get low cost because now batteries are actually getting cheaper every day? So in the cost efficiency is going to be better or not? I can try to answer that. Uh, well, um, batteries are, of course, uh, already mass produced, uh, and there is. Um, I've seen, uh, for example, BN, um, BNEF's uh, assessment where they have this uh, constant learning rate, which I think is anathema uh, because uh, it kind of converges to zero, and that, and the cost of battery cannot converge to zero; it can only converge to the cost. Uh, of the raw materials and th that's a fixed floor they cannot get any cheaper than that uh, you cannot get batteries that are cheaper than materials you uh, build them with uh, in the case of hydrogen of course you have this uh, permanent issue of lower efficiency of fuel cells compared to batteries batteries are also heavier so this efficiency is true for as long as you're not considered the fact of that the powertrain has its own weight and uh, uh, if the weight starts becoming uh, a concern and that is the case of heavy duty if you have for example it's tesla semi then it's going to have a lot of batteries and that those batteries are going to steal uh carrying capacity from uh, um from the rest uh, of the truck and that can, can be somewhat tolerable in america where you have a uh, yeah uh, bigger trucks in europe uh, maybe not so much and in general uh, you need to look at uh, uh, the whole total cost of ownership uh, it's true you get uh, more efficient for the batteries uh, but uh, if you can manage to have uh, a decent infrastructure for hydrogen distribution and it's a lot easier for heavy duty than for light duty then you i believe you have a good business case uh, uh, the heavier the duty it is um, thank you to all the speakers i have a question to uh, federico for the stash project uh, it's um, quite clear, you know, what could be the benefits of uh, standardization in terms of production and also integrating into the vehicles. Uh, maybe I missed the point, but have you also considered the uh, considered it considered the design of these uh, standardized modules from the LCA perspective, also with regard to recycling, this ease of e recycling, ease of disassembly. <laughs> Uh, you did not miss point because I did not mention it, but we actually uh, were um, suggested to look more at it in our midterm review. It's not part of the original scope, but we'll do something uh, about it. Uh, it's not quite clear exactly at which point, but definitely it's, uh, it's a good question. Um, I guess we had one comment from Guido, or is that no. already soft? Okay. <laughs> Uh, any further questions from the audience? It was just a curiosity for Stash in particular, uh, because I was thinking at uh, the revision of the weight and di in dimension directive. And I think when you started the project, of course, you basically focused on the standard vehicles. How is it changing for the future? Did you see and did you take into consideration what will change in the next 10 years because the size and the dimensions of the trucks will change? Uh, short answer, no. <laughs> uh, of course, that's part of uh, why we should have an industry uh, grouping that taking uh, care of the standard over the next few years uh, after the project is over. I suggest you to do so, absolutely. It's, it's important, I think, and it will give you also the speed up to market and to see what could be the future in the specific trucks. Because, of course, this would be the kind of trucks that will be designed in the next 10 years. Okay, then maybe one question uh, to kind of sum the discussion up a little bit, uh, maybe especially towards the uh, fuel cell colleagues. Um, if you, uh, I, I always remember when writing a application for, for a project, uh, if I would do the same application again, I would do it a little bit differently than before. So especially for the application in the fuel cell, uh, in the heavy duty sector, when you could reframe your project a little bit, what would be the kind of shift, at least uh, regarding uh, that special application that you have here? 
<laughs> more budget, more testing. <laughs> more budget, more testing. <laughs> Is that it? <laughs> <laughs> That's basically it. No, for sure. I mean, um, we kind of bound it in this budgetary uh, framework, right? And um, data is valuable. And this is the reason why I would consider having uh, a little bit more focus on um, the testing side. Yeah. So development, for sure, yeah, we have to do all these developments. But testing is really important. This is my conclusion. <laughs> From our side, um, what we what we would really have liked to have done wouldn't have changed anything uh, with what we did, but we we needed a third iteration of um, a membrane electrode assembly to, to to test in in, in short stacks. Um, there's so much learning that's generated from each of the generations and seeing how it behaves, how the new materials behave once they're scaled up and then submitted to, 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 the, to the testing. Um, and we needed a, a third generation actually to bring that learning finally together, I think, so that we could associate both the performance and the durability. Uh, and, and so that's, yeah, it, but it would have needed a, a slightly longer project and, and a bit more budget. Mm -hmm. But we wouldn't have done it differently. It, 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 we just needed a bit more time, a bit more money. So you're asking if I have any regrets. <laughs> uh, <laughs> well, I think more time would have been useful. Uh, we started Stash with the idea of finishing within three years, and that would have been fine if everything had just uh, snapped in. Uh, one thing we did not account for in, in the time planning was that uh, we need to align with uh, the development cycle in the fuel cell companies, and that is not something that uh, they are very willing to share at the beginning. And then when it shows up, okay, but we are really going to prepare the, the new stack uh, two years from now, okay, but that's going to be after the end of the project, okay, amendment, and then that's uh, when Pietro starts to suffer. <laughs> Definitely, we, this kind of project will need at least four years. Okay, thanks again for, for, the, for all the answers that, that you had to provide for us. Uh, last chance for the audience, if there's one question left, otherwise, uh, yeah. Just a very question. Um, again, I don't know if it was already addressed. Um, uh, I don't know the details uh, to Federico. Uh, we speak a lot about modularity, flexibility, interoperability. Was it, uh, is it somehow considered to also make these fuel cell modules, uh, or at least let's say, harmonize the designs with uh, the modularity that we think about when we design battery packs? for example, or battery systems, just so you can have the same dimension of a pack package fitting into a fuel cell electric or a battery electric vehicle. That's all. Short answer, yes. And specifically, the picture of the truck I shown when they had the two A-sized uh, um, fuel cell modules by a plastic omnium built a VDL, that used to ha house uh, a battery. Roland's not looking, so I'll throw in one last question. Just on the stash side, just for interest again, you've got your box dimensions. Is there any orientation limit? Can you turn your box upside down and the thing will still run? Uh, you can uh, ask for a, uh, an upside down box, uh, but then uh, def I mean you have uh, um, liquid water coming out, so definitely orientation, and you have uh, a drain. So uh, we actually consider that the uh, possibility of having uh, a, a tiltable one, but uh, it can be provided by a few some manufacturers if they want, but that's not part of the standard. But it's, it's possible. Uh, not upside down though. That's not going to work. Mm -hmm. Okay, so if there's n are no more questions left, then again, thanks to all the uh, presentations, uh, presenters for the presentations and uh, for having all the questions answered for, from, from your side today. So thanks again. Okay, good morning from uh, our side and welcome back to the session. We're going to continue the previous session uh, on uh, hydrogen for heavy duty. Uh, that was uh, my colleague Pietro before told you about the um, the importance of and the, uh, between let's say the, to, the, the, the low TRL development that they were the, the previous projects that they were presenting and now we're going to the deployment phase 
and which is one step before, let's say, the market upscale and the innovation phase. My name is George Jamalis. I work in DigiMove. I'm, uh, I work in the Research Innovation Unit from DigiMove. And uh, I'm happy to moderate this session together with uh, Roran from uh, RWTH. And uh, we, have, uh, we have actually two projects to present, uh, both on the on different aspects, equally important. One is on the refueling and, uh, and the refueling infrastructure for heavy duty. And uh, without further ado, I give the floor to Visan Matler, who works in Toyota since uh, 2007. And, um, with uh, different posts, and uh, currently he's in the uh, research and development fuel cell division since uh, 2017, if I got it correctly. And uh, yes, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Much. Okay, so I'm not uh, myself the project coordinator, but I participated in this project, so I will try to do my best to uh, explain the prior project, which is uh, development of a protocol for heavy duty uh, fueling. So, uh, first, the, I will go to an overall project presentation. Uh, it was normally intended to be a two-year project, uh, but due to COVID, we had to extend it a little bit, so it became uh, two years and nine months, actually. And uh, most of the budget went into uh, testing of our simulation software in real-life situations uh, to check uh, what the tank temperature would do internally at different locations uh, when fueling at high flows. So there, this was a little bit of a special project because it's not uh, only European project. There were several other companies involved outside Europe. Uh, big thanks to Toyota uh, North America, who assisted a lot into this project project and especially to Steve Matheson from First Element Fuel from California who also participated in this project. You can also see uh, Nicola for example, uh, these uh, non-European companies, they participated to this uh, uh, project without any funding. Um, so we know that there was already a protocol available for light duty vehicles. Uh, most of us are very happy with this protocol. It's a one. Uh, it's actually two protocols. There is a table based version and an MC formula version for light duty vehicles, and it's worldwide used all over. Huh? Um, however, it was a, a protocol from SAE, uh, J2601, and uh, it's not uh, really an ISO international protocol or EN protocol, So, and it's difficult to use SAE into EU regulatory uh, frameworks. So we needed, uh, first of all, to have a, yeah, a more general protocol on ISO level and also uh, a protocol for higher flows. Obviously, uh, uh, fueling uh, heavy duty vehicles with the light duty vehicle protocol would be way too slow. Mm -hmm. So the overall objective was to support those, this uh, standardization and so actually, I have to say that the Pride protocol, uh, well, fr the result from the Pride project, which is finished already, is not a, a copy-paste protocol that you can immediately program into your dispenser and you can go ahead with it. It's more uh, the laying the foundation stones for developing protocols because protocol development takes much longer and much more testing than uh, just two years. And uh, this was done for for uh, heavy duty vehicle high flows up to 300 grams per second, which is very high, uh, for 350, 500 and 700 bar uh, conditions. So uh, there were a lot of experts involved from Air Liquide, other uh, companies who are very specialized in this and were able to, to test uh, a lot of these fueling situations. Mm -hmm. So let's uh, have a look at the results. Um, so, as I mentioned, uh, light duty vehicle protocol already existed, uh, but that was for yeah, 2 to 10 kilogram. There was uh, an extra chapter in that protocol where you could go above 10 kilogram. It was called category D, but honestly, 
um, this was suitable. It says here 30 kilograms, I would rather say 20 kilograms, 25 kilograms uh, within a decent time. You could go uh, higher, uh, in theory unlimited, but then the fueling time would take so long, it would never be accepted by logistic partners. Mm. So uh, there was a real need for it uh, because uh, at that moment with the light duty vehicle uh, protocol, the fuel speed was only limited to a flow of 90 grams per second. So we wanted to fuel 30 to 100 kilograms, uh, much faster fuel and all uh, fueling yeah, within 10 minutes. That was actually the goal uh, of that. Um, and what was the approach that we took? Well, the current approach from SAEJ2601, uh, that was a fueling which was also possible to do even in non-communication mode because they took from all uh, manufacturers all the thermophysical properties of all different components and like pipes and tanks and manifolds, uh, receptacles, nozzle, uh, hoses, etc. And uh, they just took the worst case condition of each individual component. Uh, and then uh, based on these worst case condition, a protocol was predefined and programmed into the dispenser. So any kind of vehicle could arrive and we could fuel safe. That was the basic intention. But obviously, if you had a vehicle which was much better than the worst case condition, uh, it would result in exactly the same fueling time, uh, but and in an end temperature of maybe 55, 60 degrees, while it could go much faster and reach 85 degrees without any problems in a much faster time. So the pride approach is a bit different. Uh, in the pride approach, there, there will be a difference between one truck and another truck, for example, even though it might have exactly the same volume, the uh, same capacity in the tanks, but maybe uh, truck number A has a much lower uh, pressure difference than truck B, and then truck A will be able to fuel faster, which was not possible with the current SAE uh, protocol. And so in this case, it were the trucks that were going to send the information to the dispenser how they are going to be fueled. I will explain you later how this is done. Hmm. So uh, the Pride protocol concepts offer performance improvements and uh, yeah, we did several testing and it, and it succeeded. Hmm. Um, and the a uh, big advantage is also that the OEMs can choose, uh, they can become competitive and they can say, okay, my truck will fuel much faster than my competitors. Um, and National uh, Laboratory in uh, California, NREL, uh, has a H2 fill simulation software. Mm -hmm. And uh, we did simulations, we checked the simulations with real life measurements and the simulations uh, and also testing has proven that it is possible to do within 10 minutes. Uh, the most recent one that I've seen was, uh, I have to remember, I think it was about 89 uh, kilograms in about nine minutes uh, time. Now I have to admit in that case, there was no uh, nozzle receptacle connection. It was a direct connection. Uh, so that makes it a little bit different, so in, but still the, the results are quite good. Mm. And it's uh, based on the advanced MC formula, uh, which was already existing for light duty vehicles, but it's an advanced version. So how does it work? Uh, first of all, the vehicle OEM, he needs to define a set of what we call T-final tables. Those are tables depending on the ambient temperature and the dispensing temperature. Uh, you, you, you check what, at these conditions, what should be normally the fueling time. Uh, under these specific conditions for this specific model. So uh, a special simulation software needs to be uh, um, developed in order to enter all the data and then it can develop these T-final uh, tables. And you can have uh, as many T-final tables as you want in your vehicle ECU and they are stored in the vehicle itself. Then when the vehicle arrives at the station, 
it will uh, sil it will have a certain temperature tank temperatures it will have a certain initial pressure and it will choose the corresponding uh, t final table and it will send that t final table to the dispenser and telling hello uh, i want to be fueled in this this way this is the way i want to be fueled for my truck mm. And this is very different to uh, the current protocols where everything is already pre-programmed into the dispenser and he will fuel any vehicle at the same in the same method so we uh, differentiated different types of uh, protocol uh, the type one protocol uh, that's the was the one which used no vehicle information so you can go uh, into non-communication mode uh, even if you want to uh, and actually type one versions uh, even based on the pride protocol they will also exist uh, actually they already exist because they are now integrated into the new standard SAE J2601-5-5 which is specifically for heavy duty vehicles um, so that's the first type the, the second type is what we call a static type where uh, a lot of uh, information is sent to the dispenser but it will uh, not really use the dynamic approach where it is continuously checking the pressures and temperatures of the vehicle um, but it will for example uh, check if fueling history was present so for example if um, a, a truck has fueled first at uh, 350 bar because uh, the the price is cheaper and then then afterwards just takes the next dispenser at uh, 700 bar to top off with a little bit more expensive that will be taken into consideration mm -hmm. and then we have the more advanced versions uh, type 3 which are called T gas initial T gas initial plus and also T gas throttle has been developed uh, where we will m take much more into account the initial uh, gas temperatures and also pressures uh, of uh, the vehicle and with T-gas throttle this is really a fully dynamic uh, protocol where the fueling continuously depends on the current uh, pressure and temperatures inside the uh, vehicle so what are the mid and long-term expected impacts well uh, it is already happening at this moment uh, within iso uh, technical committee 197 uh, working group 24 has been established and there are uh, three different uh, standards in that one uh, iso 19885-1 is a general standard concerning uh, fueling protocols for uh, heavy duty vehicles dash two is concerning the communication between the vehicle and the station but dash three um, is about the protocol itself and and of course those protocols will be used to program uh, the stations and there is a subgroup uh, 3b uh, which is uh, called the pride protocol uh, it's based of course on the the pride project and it will go further and it will be able to uh, fuel with very high flows up to 300 grams per second mm -hmm um the hardware is still lacking uh, there is already hardware for 700 bar heavy duty fueling uh, based on a 90 grams per second uh, nozzle and receptacles those are already existing uh, but however uh, within iso 17268-2 it must be sorry for the mistake here this is incorrect uh, it must be dash two there is uh, or the the discussions concerning the geometry of the high flow nozzle and receptacle uh, are still need to start so they will start one of these months mm. so that one will come a little bit later and then of course we have the dispenser communication it's uh, yeah still a lot of discussions going on in that working group shall we go for wi-fi bluetooth uh, near field communication maybe direct connection like with a uh, electrical vehicle so this is go ongoing uh, but in the and ISO 19885-3 as I said so there are uh, multiple protocols and some several of them will be based on pride so there will be uh, not only subgroup 3b but also subgroup 
3E, uh, which is uh, more on a 90 grams per second, but uh, based on pride, uh, but, and, maybe, and also two times 90 grams per second, hmm, as a twin nozzle one. Hmm. Um, yep, and as I already mentioned, the Dash 5 is actually already based on, thanks to the work of Pride, uh, is already based on the Pride protocol, but with a difference because we are still uh, linked to the infrared communication. Uh, infrared communication is not uh, yet still rated, so uh, that there, that one will. Uh, have the tables not programmed into the vehicle, but into the dispenser. Mm. Then, um, so landscape is, uh, what is uh, contained, uh, it will be about 350 bar, 120 grams per second, is already existing, uh, but yeah, honestly for CEP Wenger, it's a table-based protocol, but it's very limited only from 20 kilograms to 42.5 kilograms, which means that if you go above that value or below that value, the Wenger table-based protocol is not applicable, but they can always use the MC form, uh, form advanced MC formula from the Dash 5, because that one goes from 10 kilogram to uh, 7,500 liters. Uh, I've, I don't know the value anymore uh, for 350 bar. So from uh, uh, 250 liter tanks to uh, 7,500 liter tanks. That's really a lot, 7,500 liter. So it's not only applicable for trucks, but it can also be used for trains or other uh, applications that are using big tanks. Mm -hmm. Then we have here the uh, 70 megapascal, 90 grams per second is already incorporated into the Dash 5 mm, as a table-based uh, version, but also it's missing here, also as an advanced MC formula uh, based on uh, the uh, advanced, M advanced MC formula based on the Pride protocol. And this can be doubled up to 180 grams per second, which is subgroup 3E, as I already explained. And then the fastest fueling will be 300 grams per second, but there you will need different hardware uh, for uh, making this possible. So that was the quick overview of uh, the Pride project. You can always contact me on uh, this email. Thank you. Thank you very much, Vincent, for your very thorough presentation. I'm sure people will have questions, so you can ask at the Q&A. We can pass now to the next and, uh, presentation. Uh, and I uh, have the pleasure of welcoming Alex Stewart, who is a partner at ERM and has been working in, for several years and in, uh, and involved in several EU hydrogen demonstration projects like uh, H2ME, Jive, uh, and of course, it's to all that uh, he's going to present currently. The floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much. Very good. So, thank you for the invitation to speak. I'd like to present the uh, H2 Hall um, project to you today, which is um, an EU uh, funded project uh, that we uh, uh, initiated and continue to coordinate. So, just very quickly, uh, who ERM is, because you may not know us. Um, I previously worked for Element Energy, um, which was a, a low carbon energy uh, effect. It was a startup back in the day uh, when I joined, and uh, we initiated and supported the majority of the um, EU demonstration projects as, uh, uh, alongside lots of other activities in low carbon energy. Um, coming up on three years ago, we were acquired by ERM, uh, and, and that's the, the new name. We've, we've adopted the, the, the name. So you may know Element Energy from, from previous projects that have been presented here and at, at other conferences. And ERM itself is a very large pure play sustainability consultancy that's building up a, an energy transition team, partly through acquisition of us and, and others. And so I'm part of what's, what's called internally sustainable en energy solutions that works across um, low carbon energy, buildings, transport and, and hydrogen. And within hydrogen, um, we've developed this specialism of initiating um, big demonstration projects and then co uh, continuing to coordinate them uh, as they go through their implementation phase. So since probably 2010, 
um, European funding bodies, primarily what was the FCHJ, EU, the Fuel Cell Hydrogen uh, Joint Undertaking, which is now the Clean Hydrogen Partnership, has funded um, increasingly ambitious demonstration projects for a wide range of hydrogen vehicles. Um, so it started, you know, back in the day with with the cute project for buses, and then and then chic and and um, uh, projects for for light vehicles, and then the current wave of projects are those that you can see here. That are some of them are approaching their end, but some of them are still going. So for cars and vans, there's HG Mobility Europe and Zephyr. Um, so that will deploy uh, by by its end. You know, uh, a thousand, one thousand four hundred um, cars and vans, and and fifty hydrogen refueling stations across Europe. Zephyr wrapping up at the moment. One hundred and eighty taxis um, and other vehicles with the Metropolitan Police in London testing uh, vehicles in, in intensive use cases. And then on buses, um, the Jive project deploying nearly 300 buses um, and HRS in 20 cities across Europe. Again, the, the latest in a long line of, of demonstration projects of buses that has, have now helped commercialise the technology and, and, and got those vehicles running reliably, efficiently, with costs now coming, coming down very strongly in, in, in the next generation of vehicles. And then H2 Bus Europe. Uh, still in still in its its ramp up, aiming for for up to 600 buses at at much lower costs and and to replicate the successes of the projects to date um, across uh, across different cities and, and with increasingly large volumes. And then finally, to get to trucks, the subject for today, um, H2 Hall is one of the first um, truck demonstration projects, as opposed to R&D projects, um, and we'll come to that in a minute, and um, deploying uh, trucks from two manufacturers. And then that has, has led directly to a, a successor project called H2 Accelerate, um, with the participation of um, Iveco, uh, Daimler and Volvo, uh, which will deploy 150 uh, hydrogen trucks and eight more stations um, in, from the midpoint of, of the decade. And the H2 Accelerate project, I'd argue, is, is sort of the one before the full commercial rollout, um, which the truck manufacturers will need to do to meet their um, fleet CO2 targets uh, in the EU regulation from 2030. So H2 Hall then, um, it started uh, five years ago, these these projects always last long, and, and as Vincent mentioned, uh, with with COVID and and then some other delays, they have a history of being extended and and uh, needing a little bit more time to to meet their objectives. So, the overall objective is to deploy um, long haul um, heavy duty, so 26 to 44 ton uh, fuel cell trucks. Um, that meet customers' requirements in a range of operating environments. So this is not R and D and and you know playing with things on a <laughs> test track. This is vehicles in service with demanding clients um, using their full uh, driving range each day, pulling loads at maximum gross weight, um, using different refueling stations, and and you know, showing, proving to the project partners and of course to to the wider um, logistics sector that fuel cell trucks are, are viable and present advantages relative to, to battery electric vehicles in certain use cases, primarily of course ones with, with high driving ranges, uh, high weights, um, possibly different uh, difficult climatic conditions um, where, where fuel cell will sit quite nicely alongside um, batteries as, as another solution for, for uh, zero emission decarbonised um, road frame. So, <coughs> These trucks didn't exist, of course, at the beginning of the project, so before you can get them onto the road, you have to design them, you have to integrate fuel cell systems, power electronics, uh, tanks, you have to homologate them so they're legal for use uh, in, in different European member states. And then, of course, you can deliver them to, to customers and, and, and get them going in, in the real world use. You need infrastructure to support those vehicles, of course, so in the different sites in, in the project, uh, refueling stations have been uh, installed or upgraded depending on the starting point ready to support those trucks as they enter service and the aim is to achieve two million kilometers uh, of day-to-day -day driving as i said in in true real world conditions and as with almost all of uh, the european projects of this type there's a strong focus on uh, monitoring and evaluation 
first of all to make sure to the to the clean hydrogen partnership that the technical criteria have been met and and it's justified the 12 million euros of, of public money that's been spent on the project uh, for which thank you and uh, and of course to also make sure that we learn as much as we can from the project to feed back to the project partners to help improve trucks and stations in the next generation, but also to help the dissemination activities uh, to show to um, fleets that these trucks have been successful, they've, they've met their technical um, requirements and they're, they're suitable to be, to be ramped up in the future um, in, in, a, in a wider range of use cases and, and a larger group of, of partners beyond these early adopters. And then there's work on developing the business case, looking at um, the total cost of ownership, where the, the most interesting market segments are, and how do you commercialise this technology starting from, of course, a very low base of, of these first 16 vehicles. So the partners are those that you see here. Um, we're, we initiated the project and we're, we're doing the coordination. Um, there are four deployment classes in Belgium, France, Germany and, and Switzerland with a range of partners that you can see there. The truck manufacturers, there are two of them, uh, VDL and uh, Iveco, <coughs> and we also have the uh, various fuel cell suppliers as formal partners in the project and then uh, various other um, partners providing either the HRS and, and the hydrogen, the hydrogen refueling stations um, or the truck operators and, and sometimes the end customers uh, for, the, for the vehicles um, to make sure that, the, that we maximise the availability of, of the learning and, and the data generated by the project. So the, the broad flow of the project is, is what you can see here. Um, so as I mentioned, there's quite a lot to, of work to do initially uh, to specify the, the trucks, you know, what, what technical characteristics will they need to meet the operational requirements, uh, such as the range, the refueling time and, and so on. Um, of course, comply with uh, length and, and weight regulations in Europe and, and pa the packaging of the fuel cell systems on the vehicle. Um, when the project started, the truck manufacturers had not yet selected their fuel cell providers, so already that was a step to select those providers and then um, work on the integration of the, of the systems into the vehicle. And then HRS site preparation, making sure of course the infrastructure is, is ready uh, for, these, uh, for these trucks. Um, then truck deployment, operation and maintenance, which is about to begin. Um, and then, as I mentioned, the monitoring analysis and, and the dissemination activities that will make sure that, that we maximise the, the European value for money and, and the, the impact of the project on helping to accelerate the, the next phase of, of deployments. So the progress to, to date, um, truck spe specifications and designs have been completed. Um, the prototypes have been built, uh, there has been internal testing of these um, vehicles to make sure that they're safe and, and suitable to, to be used on public roads. The um, Iveco manufacturing site has been opened uh, in the, during the time frame of the project and we're now having, uh, we're in the, nearly at the end of the, the truck construction for the 16 vehicles that will be uh, put into service. There's been some uh, hold-ups on homologation, as there often is. Um, so uh, vehicles that were expected in end of 2023 will probably go into service in the first half of 2024. And then they'll need to operate for probably a year or 18 months to meet that 2 million kilometres um, target for operation, uh, which is one of the technical criteria of, of our funding. So here are the trucks, um, so they're both tractor units, um, uh, a 4x2 uh, tractor from VDL and a 6x2 for, for the Aveco group. Um, and uh, you can see there the fuel systems behind the, behind the cab, um, still leaving, uh, leaving space to, to uh, fit the trailers behind that. So while the vehicles have been um, uh, are being prepared, the stations have been installed, and in some cases they're already in use by other vehicles um, developed through other uh, projects. Which is why you can see DAF trucks and uh, Hyundai's uh, in the in the top left there, um, using the uh, H2 Energy stations. So in other words, to make sure the stations are in service and they're not sitting idle 
um, pending the arrival of these trucks, the, the stations have been uh, sited and, and dimensioned to support other uh, vehicles that are either currently in service or will be deployed alongside H2 Hall um, to, to maximise the, the utilisation and, and the business case, of course, for those stations. Um, we don't have many outputs yet from the trucks, of course, because they're not yet in service. Um, we do have data collection ongoing for the stations that have been put into uh, operation. You can see here the, the quantities of hydrogen uh, in the blue bars um, uh, throughout the, so those are daily average um, utilization of stations. So probably three or four uh, fills per day um, depending exactly how the, empty the trucks are when they arrive. What you can see here is the average speed of dispensing in kilograms a minute and you can see in that orange line a seasonal trend where the speed goes down during the summer and back up in the autumn and the winter because the uh, cooling uh, requirements of the station uh, change as, as a function of season and the speed goes down um, to protect the, the maximum internal tank temperature these numbers are significantly lower than what you've just seen in Vincent's presentation I think underlines the need for the Pride project and the next wave of refueling protocols because if you're at 1.8 um, kilograms a minute here even at the maximum then that's 18 kilograms in in 10 minutes if you've got large tanks of 50 kilos for some of these long haul trucks you're nearly at 30 minutes and and that's not going to be acceptable to end users and is not really a distinguishing feature from uh, a megawatt scale uh, charger for um, battery electric trucks so we need the next wave of protocols um, as Vincent has has described uh, to, to reinstate those advantages of um, very fast refueling even with the the large tanks that you see here so the trucks are, are going into service, as I mentioned, but there are also already quite a few um, learnings um, from the work done uh, to date. Um, so there's been a lot of work on, on the selection of different um, refueling uh, pressures to start with, and there are two already within this project. So the VDL um, uses 350 bar, um, and Iveco is using 700. Daimler currently talking about liquids still on the vehicle side even though the vehicles for H to accelerate will use gaseous refueling. Um, there's been work on selecting the uh, the route um, distances so the optimum logistics flows to make the best use of uh, the, the the technical characteristics of these trucks so those are between 250 and 600 kilometers as the network develops of course you could do a lot more than that you could start doing a thousand kilometers with refueling um, at the halfway point and there's been work to select different um, mission profiles climatic conditions different uh, topography uh, with more or less relief to, to to show that these vehicles can haul things up hills and and manage the exactly the same quality of service that diesel can provide there have been some specific trailer requirements in germany um, that, that have had to be um, met um, the a change in the plan from a rigid trailer with a drawbar to a to a tractor unit so there's still things that need um, finalising at a regulatory level uh, at member state um, levels as opposed to uh, the whole of Europe. Um, same story on, on some of the divergent planning and permitting procedures so country and even region specific permitting procedures for HRS causing delays and costs in deploying those stations um, and the need to work very early with, with the competent authorities um, to make sure that the timelines are respected. Um, we mentioned the, the Pride project there that, uh, that's, that's essential for, for the future of um, hydrogen trucking. And then work, the lessons learned on, on the business case, the stations have to be um, uh, very highly performing. Um, that has not always been the case with light vehicle stations and heavy vehicle stations there's more of a focus on redundancy and and ensuring that there are no single points of, of failure because you can't have trucks um, sitting around waiting for, for hydrogen if 
if we're going to encourage the next wave of logistics companies to deploy these things. And then, of course, high utilization, an obvious point, high utilization is, is a critical component for making the, the business case work. And that's a challenge when, from the OEMs, we expect an exponential type ramp up towards 2030 as they need to meet their, their targets. So there's a challenge here of building the infrastructure starting from now because of the time required to get this in the ground but the fact that the trucks will come relatively late in the decade and other ways to share the infrastructure with other vehicle types to use captive fleets to, to carefully align the, the deployment of the trucks and stations to avoid uh, multiple years of underutilization um, in advance of the trucks come. And then, of course, collaboration with, with other projects is, is highly valuable. I've, I've listed some of them here, um, looking at the durability and lifetime of the, of the stacks themselves, um, standardization of fuel cell modules um, to simplify integration in, in the trucks, but also potentially other vehicles related to trucks like coaches and, and even off-road machinery. Um, and then there's, there's uh, potential for jointly communicating on, on the, the state of the sector and, and the benefits of hydrogen you know, across the different um, EU projects. I think I've covered most of this. I think the other thing I would mention in the top right here is expectation management. Um, these are demonstration projects and and they're there to go through the teething troubles and, and learn things so that they can be addressed before the next wave of, of um, uh, deployments. We've seen that very successfully in the bus projects where early in the bus projects the availability of the vehicles was uh, very low, uh, nowhere near diesel with plenty of breakdowns, often uh, in fact very rarely to do with the fuel cell and the hydrogen components and often to do the fact with the fact that they were um, hand assembled in in very small numbers compared with the more series production for the diesel vehicles and that had an impact on availability and similarly spare parts weren't widely available we were flying engineers across europe to repair things rather than uh, using local technicians and after several years of um, observing that and working very hard to rectify it with spare parts placed close to the points of operation, increased training, looking at uh, failure points and improving components, we're now at a stage where the buses are operating very reliably. Um, you never saw that problem with, with Vincent's uh, Mirais, they've been operating extremely reliably from the beginning, which reflects the fact that, that global OEMs uh, can can just build things in, in big numbers with with extremely high quality control um, and and the buses are now uh, approaching the, those level of um, those levels of reliability so to summarize what's going to happen from from now on so the the truck deployment is expected in 2024 and the collection of the operational data will start um, there's a lot of work to be done um, collecting that operational um, data and then processing that looking at reliability um, and, and fuel consumption and some of the technical um, milestones that, that we're trying to hit and then using those data in life cycle cost analysis looking at well to wheels um, and, and um, the uh, environmental um, performance of the vehicles and then taking those data and looking at what the impacts are for the next wave of commercialization. Can we identify the, the segments of, of logistics where these vehicles make the most sense, the geographies where they most make, make most sense, and how do you then plan uh, the rollout of vehicles and, and connecting them with, with the, the most um, interested customers uh, to get a business case that works for the vehicles, the hydrogen, and for the end users. Thank you very much for your attention and, and thank you for the, the funding we've received for the Clean Hydrogen Partnership to enable the project. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alex, for your very thorough presentation. I'm sure people will be interested to discuss these issues and uh, I'll pass the floor to Roland to kick off the Q&A yeah. session. Thanks for, for the presentations again and for the nice summary of the two projects. Um, Maybe again, I will start with the first question and then hand over to the audience. Um, 
Maybe the first question regarding the Pride project. Um, as we know from battery electric trucks, uh, there's quite an intensive communication between the station and the, and the vehicle. Uh, even if it's a, it's a car or it's a truck, they have quite a good uh, exchange protocol. Um, you proposed some next steps uh, for, uh, for future protocols of hydrogen refueling. Maybe it's even two questions. Uh, which protocol do you think is the next one that really comes into application? And what is the big obstacle in the way um, for the communication right now? Why is there a need for this T final tables and why do not exchange data directly from vehicle to, to station? Okay, those are two questions. Yeah. <laughs> Let me start with the communication uh, question. So, f in order to uh, to enable Pry to work properly, you will need uh, bi-directional communication, which is which needs to be trusted, 100% trusted. Um, so that is for sure. If you don't have that one, maybe there is another good chance that we can fuel 100 kilograms in less than 10 minutes because then you will stick to the the protocol which we are having now in SAE with the dash 5 which is already not so bad honestly it's a it's, it's performing quite well but it's not what the what the target is yet um, but as I already mentioned, these discussions are already uh, continuous uh, in the ISO. Uh, and there is no, not yet uh, any uh, decision made on how this communication will look like, uh, but it is absolutely necessary. And then the, the second question was? Um, the second question was um, basically regarding your three types of communication protocols, so real-time application mm -hmm. of these T-final uh, protocols. Um, which one do you see next coming up, basically? Is it still ah, yeah. relating on the vehicle side or even uh, exchange information already? Yeah, maybe I'm a bit biased, but um, I think the Dash 5 SAE will, for the next years will be a, the, the real standard that everybody will start to use because it's already available. You can immediately use it in, in your dispenser. So. Uh, we will have to wait for the ISO protocol to, to be published or at least the draft version to be published before uh, station operators will start to integrate this. Yeah. Um, the Japanese, they have already started last summer uh, using the uh, actually the Dash 5, uh, it, is a, it was a table based version but it doesn't matter which one it is, but using with the, the two uh, light duty vehicle nozzles and they were able to achieve at uh, 20 29 degrees ambient temperature, uh, uh, 60 kilograms in less than 10 minutes. So that way it is possible and you could then, for example, use a, a light duty, full duty vehicle dispenser which can fuel two Mirai simultaneously also for fueling one truck. So that, that technology could be implemented already today uh, and then you can fuel very, very fast. Uh, for the 300 gram per second, we will have to wait a little bit. Uh, so. Uh, uh, it's a bit guesswork when uh, the hardware and protocol will be finished. Mm. Okay, thanks for, for the answer. So maybe now for the audience, uh, feel free uh, to just raise your hand for if you have any questions. Um. Thank you again to both the speakers. Um, I'm not really the expert, but uh, uh, this is particularly uh, to uh, a Pride project. Uh, I can imagine that there is some influence of the storage technology itself and the capacities. Is this something that's also taken into consideration for the different protocols? Yes, yeah, so th this is part of the, the communication, but actually this can also be done with the current infrared communication uh, where we, we can explain uh, what the, not only the total tank size is, but also, for example, the individual tank size uh, could be transferred to the dispenser and this is taken into account into the protocol. I'm not sure if that is an answer to your question. <laughs> There are different types of storage technologies, right? The mechanism by which uh, hydrogen is stored. Right? Does this have any influence? 
ah, you mean like type 3, type 4, yes. and so on. Uh, that is uh, in the Pride protocol, it is foreseen because it's only included into those T final tables. Yeah. So, a uh, type 3 tank will be able to fuel much, much faster than a type 4 tank, for example. Hmm? Yeah. Um, a quite simple question. Are these uh, new protocols that are about to be established, are those completely future-proof? So, um, are those, I would call them flow rates that you are referring to, will they be sufficient even in the next five or ten years? Or is this like very speculative? I'm not an expert on the topic, but I, I, I was just wondering how what, what, what kind of advancements needs to happen in, in, in order to have wide deployment in, in the next years, basically. Yeah, it has been the target from the very beginning of the Pride project to, to achieve diesel parity. So if you can fuel 100 kilograms in less than 10 minutes, then you achieve diesel parity. Hmm. Uh, further questions? Um, we have one over there. Um, I um, also for within the Pride project, um, would there also be some sort of error detection in the future in place for refueling? So let's say you have some sort of well leakage or that kind of stuff, where indeed, especially dynamic way of refueling, so less based on the T final maps, um, where you could use those sensor data to detect something that is not going right or something like that, so have more of a fail safe. That was uh, the smart tank concept or leakages and so on that was not part of the scope of the project hmm. okay maybe i have a question for the h2o project uh, just to have at least some parity here <laughs> um, so in the session before we have heard a lot about uh, there's a degra the degradation of the fuel cells and uh, when thinking about your project being such a huge application project uh, will that be part of your investigation later on when the trucks are in operation, how the use case uh, kind of influences the degradation? Uh, yes, it, it will be. Um, I guess there's a question about how how much degradation you see in the one year or 18 months uh, of the project. Uh, but yes, certainly it'll be tracked. Some of it summarized at a public level, but certainly at the OEM level, um, they'll be collecting um, efficiency data and and you know all the voltage data and, and things that you need to, to track that degradation. So far, I, I don't think it's been a huge problems in the vehicles we've seen so far. Uh, in the in the buses, there are you know DC DC converter problems that impact the reliability a lot. I've not seen too much about degradation of the stacks themselves, but I guess like everything, the vehicles, the, the highest number of vehicles are the most recent ones because it's on a curve and they haven't yet seen five, seven, eight years of service. Yeah. Okay, so we have another question. <laughs> okay, so um, again it's about H2 hold, just to keep some balance again with the questions. So uh, we're talking about this uh, degradation, I would like to ask you, do you have any particular goal of the track availability? What, what are you aiming at? I'm not sure if the availability is a metric that's tracked. It certainly is that it's tracked. I'm not sure it's the technical criteria of the um, of the call. The expectation, just like the refueling speed, is diesel parity. Um, for the buses, I think we've got to yeah from 60 or 70 percent very early in those projects through the teething pro uh, um, problems through to. 95 99 percent availability and that's where the trucks will need to be certainly at you know 99 percent or, or better to be competitive um i don't expect that from the first few months of operation of two completely new vehicles uh, to be completely clear um but that's why we do the projects and and the expectation is uh to equal diesel in theory these vehicles have fewer moving parts and and less brake wear and and yeah, fewer things to go wrong um once they're made at scale and and you know the, the the qa is is as tight as it is for for other technologies but i think we've started to see that with 
battery electric solutions now you're seeing the benefits of that simplicity translate into into reliability and no reason why you shouldn't see the same for fuel cells but possibly not with the first vehicles that come off the line so if there are I have another one yeah. I have another one as well <laughs> yeah if there's nobody okay. else uh, so we will just uh, have questions in front here maybe we have one from the audience again okay Thank you. Uh, Daniel Sitz from uh, RWTH Aachen. Uh, I have a question to Pride again, um, because you talked about how the new standards are in development right now, specifically for communication. So uh, what I would like to ask is how much potential do you see in just copying some things from the battery standards? For example, plug and charge, and let's call it plug and dispense for hydrogen. Um, how much potential do you see there for just, you know, take work that has been done and adapt this for hydrogen? Why not? It's uh, it, it, that's one of the uh, proposals in this working group to use exactly the same uh, communication methodology as for electrical vehicles, and for example, uh, have uh, electrical connection the same type, exactly the same as uh, on the nozzle, uh, which performs according to the same protocol and as for electrical vehicles. Mm -hmm. Okay, then I will have another question from my side. <laughs> um, just maybe out of your experience, um, as you have some stations always uh, already available for the refueling of of, um, of the of the fuel cell trucks, um, do you see at the moment a already a competition for for the clean hydrogen that we have? And especially when thinking about the rollout phase, there will be even more competition with other industries uh, for the clean hydrogen available. And um, in your opinion, is, this, is that already a, uh, a problem for you to get the hydrogen or will that be in the future? That's a very good question. W what we've seen with the hydrogen refueling stations is a trend from small stations often with on-site electrolysis because the volumes didn't just justify moving hydrogen around through to what's normally called semi-centralized so we're not talking about a huge smr plant a thousand kilometers away but you know an, an electrolyzer at the multiple megawatts scale connected hopefully directly to the renewables delivering in a radius of 100 kilometers or so um, and there the the trucking emissions for the delivery are, are minimal compared with the the uh, savings from the the use in the, in the fuel cell and um, you can access lower electricity costs and so on so far those chains have been separate from what's going on in industry so in that sense there's no competition it's often the same actors but it's not the same projects that are supplying um, those mobility solutions and and industry which often needs in the hundreds of megawatt scale we're now starting to see a combined production that will serve multiple end uses because as i mentioned the the exponential ramp up of hydrogen towards the end of the decade is really difficult to manage through in, in terms of underutilization. So the project promoters are looking at ways you can find base load from industrial applications and then and then either have mobility as a small but growing part of your mix or have a have something that you can, you can scale and increase the capacity for the for the same site. Um, the Shell Holland hydrogen project is a good example of that, where a hundred percent of that output will just go into the refinery. It's complete self-consumption to decarbonise the hydro cracking and and the the, the grey hydrogen current in the refinery. But as the mobility uh, ramps up, then you can either increase the capacity or divert some of that hydrogen back into mobility uses to ready to the stations. I can maybe also add. Maybe I can add something to that concerning competition. Uh, and I already explained uh, just a while ago. In Europe, we are really front runner. Huh? The, uh, for hydrogen production and electrolyzers, there is no area in the world that has so many companies involved in developing uh, these technologies. And also for stations, so, so uh, there are sort of more than 30 station manufacturers in Europe, and they are exporting to Korea and Japan and uh, California. All 
over the world and, and this is really a very big asset and it's very good that to see that there are so many companies seeing a business case in, into uh, these technologies. Mm. Let's hope we can keep it this way. Mm. Okay, uh, I have a question on H2O. So you mentioned uh, about the charging speed that you currently have is 1.8 kilograms per minute or something like that. Yeah. So for 50 kilograms, you need about uh, 30 minutes. Uh, now that you are going to go to the, let's say, to the deployment of the trucks, do you plan to use uh, something, uh, some of the knowledge developed from the right uh, uh, project in order to go to, let's say, to reach faster charging speeds or? I th yeah, absolutely. So the the caveat with the the charging the refueling series I showed there is those are for vehicles with smaller tanks in the range of you know fifteen or twenty kilos per fill. So at those speeds, you're back to the ten minutes or so that's acceptable to users for those tank sizes. But those are current generation stations it, using effectively the worst case that that uh, Vincent described. So mm -hmm. that will not suffice for. Uh, 50 kilos, you know, 80 kilos with you know multiple tanks and so on, um, and the the pride learnings will certainly be implemented in that when they're standardised. The the slight concern I have is is the timescales because there are stations being funded by this project, by the Connecting Europe facility, for example, with deployment targets in 2024, 2025. Mm -hmm. Equipment has long lead times. It has to be ordered a, a year in advance often. And there's a risk that the first wave of large stations that are capable of refueling lots of trucks and will have pride of place on the, on the TNT network will not actually be capable of refueling quickly enough to assure a high quality service. And if truck users can choose between a recent station with the pride protocols or, or whatever they turn into um, versus something built three years ago that's that's slower then they can choose where they refuel and and that station will will see no customers i don't know that's not if you have a view on how retrofitable some of those things are if it's about compressors and and the flow rates through the refrigeration system you just have to change a station but could you imagine a, a stations going in now where the compressors and everything else is dimensioned well, but you just need to add that intelligence and communication at the nozzle end and, and in, the, in the dispenser to then unlock a, a fast refueling rate? It, well, ex expanding extending the capacity that is for sure pro uh, possible at this moment and until you go to very large capacities where you need where you're going with the direct compressor fueling of course then you you change the concept of your station but as long as you add capacity it should be possible um, for the the fueling speed however if you want to go to uh, high flow uh, yeah you you will need a completely new dispenser with heat exchanger uh, flow regulators everything that is able Able to cope with those high flows. Yeah. Okay, maybe giving the chance to the audience again for, for a follow up. Andreas Dörder from the Austrian Ministry for Climate Protection, Environment, Energy, Mobility, Innovation, Technology. Um, I'm responsible for vehicle technology development funding at the ministry and therefore of course my interest is in mobile applications but nevertheless we have a national hydrogen strategy and with this respect as we are responsible for energy policy as well and environmental policy um, there is a, a clear let's say statement that uh, hydrogen has to be focused on fields which near, really need hydrogen like for example in the steel uh, industry and so on so my question to you is um, let's say is hydrogen fuel says something what for freight especially for freight and heavy duty vehicles is really necessary and uh, let's say without any um, alternative or are batteries uh, doing the same job i mean they are m many advancements in with batteries but nevertheless the standard uh, ideology was that for small vehicles and short distances batteries are good but that for long distances and heavy duty you need hydrogen fuel cells so what what is your opinion on that Go 
Yeah, uh, now I'm going to speak from Toyota Motor Europe, <laughs> not from the Pride project. Uh, we, we, we are a very big global company, so we, we bet on everything, <laughs> we, because there will be regions in uh, the world that want different technologies than other regions, so we, are, we, we think everything is needed, most specifically more for Europe. Uh, they both will exist in some situations, you will have customers who will be uh, very happy with having a battery electric truck, for sure, uh, but there will be also many customers that that really would prefer to have a hydrogen truck and mainly because of the fueling speed and that will be the most important uh, aspect we can see the same with buses uh, hydrogen uh, fuel cell buses are more expensive than battery buses uh, everywhere uh, but still there are bus operators that have maybe already a certain range of battery buses but they also want hydrogen buses there is a reason for that it could be flexibility it could be lack of space to put a charger uh, for every battery bus uh, if he has 50 60 buses uh, and he prefers a station which you can which is takes much less space uh, for fueling a number of buses there are many many different variety of customers so there will be a variety also in the applications and actually the same is true for passenger cars by the way and eh? uh, we know that the minority will be fuel cell but there it uh, or light duty vehicles in general i'm also talking about vans and pickups and so on uh, the maybe the majority might be battery but there will for sure also be customers who will really would like to have the uh, the advantages of the fuels, hydrogen fuel cell. So it's not one or, or the other. I think I completely agree with, with what Vincent has said. In specifically in heavy duty mo mobility, right. there is a. Oh, sorry. The um, within heavy duty mobility, there is a kind of very theoretical model where you can run a battery electric truck four and a half hours for example until the mandated break and then you arrive at a megawatt scale charger you charge 45 minutes during your break and then you do the next four and a half hours and if that works you never need hydrogen right your your limitation is the human at the wheel and off you go but it requires no queuing for the chargers because otherwise you're having a break and then wasting time while you're still queuing it requires megawatt charges everywhere with sufficient thickness of cable to bring all that power to the stations which is equivalent of, of tens of megawatts that you'd be putting into trucks at an average truck stop um, and then you've got other vehicles that don't just go trunking up and down motorways and they do things in rural areas and and hills and and elsewhere and forestry operations and so on Footprint. exactly so so i think you will need both both technologies and we've seen with the uh, with the buses a very good example is gatwick airport for for buses they've recently installed a liquid logistics hydrogen refueling station so the hydrogen is gaseous when it goes into the vehicles but the delivery and the storage on the site is liquid and when you look at the footprint of that station that can do 140 buses it's tiny the the efficiency of, of space compared with reinforcing the grid and having one uh, one sufficiently powerful charging point per bus it's it's very impressive and the liquids of course reduce the number of truck movements you need to supply the station so i think for places like that uh, for buses but but also for trucks there will be space where you a place where you just cannot reinforce the grid and and deploy the sufficient infrastructure and that's where the the hydrogen will will work but even the biggest hydrogen fans i think would say if it works with batteries and the battery infrastructure then you should do batteries because the energy efficiency of the chain is better the the operational costs will almost always be lower um, if you can make it work for you but that won't be always the case okay maybe a final question from the audience Sorry. or we are shunted with you okay okay so then we are done thanks again for all the questions thank and, you all. Um, Thank you.